Welcome to another episode of the Chorus Podcast. Have you ever wondered how a tourist attraction was made famous in the first place? Well, in this social media frenzy, many are tailored for the gram. But what if it also opens our horizons to into the history, into the heritage, uh, and the legacy that even locals hold a dear memory of? Well, today's guest exactly does that for Singapore. To date, a feature of uh, at the National Art Museum and over 30, over 30 mural paintings all around the small country of Singapore. Good afternoon, Yu Chong, and it's an honour to have you on our show today. Hi, everyone. Hi, Jun. Good afternoon. <laughs> Hello. Thanks for having me. Yeah, how are you today? How are you feeling today? I'm great. I'm very yeah. excited. You're yeah, very excited. Thank you so much for setting uh, this interview. Honestly, uh, I've read uh, I've read a lot of your interviews, a lot of your articles, and also appreciated a lot of your uh, mural paintings because uh, our my our office is actually situated in Chinatown, where you have now over like ten over such paintings, right? Uh, yeah, ten in Chinatown. Yes, ten in Chinatown, and they really depict uh, like a heritage and uh, and a scene of Chinatown that we haven't really seen before. At, at least we are not very used to, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. I, Young, <laughs> yeah, but it reminds me a lot of um, uh, what my mom and my dad would tell me when they were young, because obviously that is an area that they would frequent a lot in the past, right? So, um, right, right from the start, I think uh, a lot of people who know you know you as a self-taught uh, painter, and you come from a background of uh, being a financial accountant and uh, a finance director. And but in two thousand eighteen, you decided to go full time as a painter. So. How did this evolution come about then, like really be, really pursuing your passion uh, full-time? Oh, okay. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, let's go back a little more about uh, how I ended up studying accountancy first and then how I transformed into an artist. So when I was in school, I studied science and then I studied accounting. These are very practical subjects of uh, my childhood times and my youth times. Um, studying art or being an artist probably is not something that I would have even thought of at that time. Uh, less accessible, for example, there, there are no, or virtually very few art schools or industries related to art. So when I studied accountancy, uh, naturally, I will get a job in accounting. And I did that for 25 years. That's that's uh, almost uh, like almost all half of your lifetime already. Yeah, right? it's half yeah. of my life. And like accountancy, it's what we often regard to Singapore as like a steel rice bowl, right? Iron rice bowl. Um, I don't know about iron rice bowl or not, but uh, I love what I did. I went into accounting uh, without much expectations and I just did my best in every job and I also love to progress. So I aim for certain things. For example, I aim for multinational companies which give me a lot of uh, overseas exposures and exposure to foreign cultures, which I like. And that's how I have uh, progressed in my career for over 25 years. And then, um, in 2015, I was taking a break from work. Oh, before that, let me say that in 2005, I also took a break of about the same number of months, about eight, nine months. So 2015 was my second stint in my whole 25-year career. Same for uh, from 2005, it's also about nine months of break. And in these two stints, I explored various things in my life that I have always hoped to do other than work and accounting. For example, in 2005, I explored video making and making animated films. Um, I also even explored uh, doing a small business like la laundry business. <laughs> <laughs> That's totally that not related to, that, that to, the, materialize. to yeah, the painter yeah. that you are now. Yeah, yeah nothing at all. And in 2015, when I was taking my second break, I actually was aiming to continue my filmmaking, video making a hobby. I even bought all the equipments, but I was distracted, totally distracted 
by all those murals that popped up in 2015 or even before that, 2014, that I've noticed. Um, I think because SG50, uh, so Singapore had many murals popped out all over the island. And I thought to myself, oh, I should also try my hands on doing it. So I went around my neighborhood and knocked on doors, uh, looking for a wall to paint. And bingo, I got a wall to paint. And then after that, uh, that mural, the first two murals that I painted, um, they were warmly received and I received lots of requests to paint on other people's walls. But then in 2016, I had to go back to work already. But I didn't want to give up painting because now I've started to get a kick of it. I enjoy it. So I continue to receive uh, commissions and requests to paint on the uh, walls of house owners, uh, businesses, business owners, uh, outdoor street murals. So I accepted these commissions, but I could only do it in the weekends. So I painted on Saturday, Sunday, and I work as an accountant from Monday to Fridays. It's, it's, uh, oh, what, that's what? a packed schedule you have. It's like no no rest days for, for you. Uh, but I enjoy it. Mm, of, course. I enjoy it. of course, I miss my family. Mm. Um, it's a trade-off for everything. Yeah, right? yeah. Mm. So I did that for three years. Three years, and then my wife started nudging me. You know, you you want to develop your art. You talk about developing your art. You you need to quit your job and spend full time to develop your art. And because my children have also quite grown up, and yeah, I thought that I should. it was time to do it. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, from from that two murals that you started in twenty fifteen, you have now expanded to thirty over of such uh, all around Singapore, right? I mean, you have so many that you can find in every corner in Singapore, literally. No, not every corner, but uh, yeah, north, south, east, west, central, even Sentosa, Changi Airport. Right. You, find it. <laughs> you have it everywhere, and especially I think uh, what. Uh, as we were talking about earlier were the 10 murals that you did in Chinatown and um, that that to me uh, some, somehow it, it didn't feel like just like a normal painting or more normal mural but it felt like there were a lot of um, history and like your personal take on how it was like back then and I wanted to ask you like um, how like what were the what was the story what were the stories uh be behind these ten murals and were there like a uh, sort of like a, a storyline that that kind of pieced them all together or were they isolated um, um meanings behind each of the mural? Okay, yes, um, you are right to have observed that all the murals are related to nostalgic old scenes of Chinatown, and that's because I grew up in Chinatown. Um, I lived in Chinatown for 26 years of my life until I got married and I moved to Spottiswood Park area. Um, I wanted to paint in Chinatown because it kind of motivated me, I want to do more. I want to create more beautiful, more meaningful work. And where else but the place where you grew up for such a long time, I had four memories. And because the first two murals were also related to like a nostalgic scene, and thereafter many of the requests and commissions that came to me were also requesting for nostalgic scenes, even their own childhood, the, the, the property owner's own childhood. So although I felt like a pigeonhole, but I also felt that it's now my niche and I should uh, make use of this strength. So for Chinatown, um, that there were there were no commissions in the beginning. I thought about wanting to do a project in Chinatown, which was the Cantonese Opera. Yeah, which you can see along Temple Street, right? Yes, it's that one, Temple mm. Street. So I did a sketch. I sent it to STB, Singapore Tourism Board, and the town council. I want to paint that mural on the stage in the Krita Air Square. But I was rejected. <laughs> um, the the reason was the that wall on the stage cannot be painted on. It needs to be left blank. It needs to be a screen for you know future performances with the projection, light projection on it. So no go. 
okay, but I didn't give up. So I wrote to I asked my friend. So what what can I do? Then he 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 said he's from URA. So he said, why don't you do a proper proposal and send it to URA, and then URA may also invite SDB to be part of it. So I did that. That's how I did sketches of six murals to be painted in Chinatown. Six murals all in one go. So I submitted it. They. That means URA and STB. They gave me a blanket approval. Wow! Wow! Blanket so approval. from zero yes. to six in, in principle, one go. Uh. blanket approval. But having said that, it's just an approval. I still have to go and look for all the house owners by myself. So back to square one. I went around. I knocked on many shop houses' doors. Even uh, went to the shop owners, and more often I will get shoot away because the shop owners would. What do you want to do? I'm selling things. You want to paint on my wall? No, 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 no. I won't introduce you to the owner. I'm not allowed to to introduce the owner. So I also approach URA. Well, of course, understandably, they cannot let anybody know who's the house owner. So I went all around and got lots of rejections from the property owners and business owners. And I almost wanted to give up, so I wrote to the MP, oh. <laughs> Dr. Lili Niu, who gave me a blessing. I said, "Okay, you can." They, they, she liked the idea, so she referred me back to the town council, and the town said, "No, no, this wall cannot. That wall cannot." Then they recommended another other walls to me. So I went down to assess the walls. I found them not suitable. For example, one wall was. Right next to the car park entrance, which was I thought was dangerous, mm. and few people walk there except cars. Mm. So I said, no, I don't think this was uh, suitable. And so back to square one, I went all around again to, and tried to find connections. URA advised me, why don't you look specifically for the wall, and they will try to find out uh, if it is the public owner. They can. Mm. So and they. Uh, I found one wall which I believe was a HDB. So easy because that yeah. one is HDB, which yeah. was the letter writer. Ah, the the very famous one that everyone would see when they when they go they to go the to Chinatown, Chinatown complex. Yeah. Yes, yes, next to Chinatown complex. Mm. So bingo! Uh, I with with URA and HDB's blessing, I did that wall with my two children. Mm. Ah, yep. was that the first one? Yes, it was the first mm. Chinatown mural. Mm. Um. And thereafter, you know, during the painting in 2018, that 2018, so from 2016 to 2018, two years has passed to so, just do one wall. And because it, it was very popular, so now after that, I got <laughs> requests from the from the Chinatown house owners to paint on their wall. Yeah, but at least your hard work did pay off, right? It was not. Uh, it was. Although you did get the core rejections, but in the end, we still managed to yeah, see the yeah. tent that we see today. But um, yeah. actually, one one thing that came to mind was that uh, because you are at that point in time, you were still um, you're still exploring mural painting in a way, right? So, did you expect that you will become like a tourism hotspot? Um, it wasn't really intended to be like a tourism hotspot. I don't know if it is a tourism hotspot. You can uh, safely say it is. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> it is, um, it is. Thank you. Okay. My, my intention was to just paint my childhood there for everyone to see and be able to appreciate what life was like in the old days. So if you say a tourism hotspot, or, I have also heard about that. People like it. Uh, for attracting tourists and then people also use some of the walls for educational purposes or even mental health purposes. So I'm happy that uh, young and old residents, tourists alike, they, they like the, the artworks. That's good. I mean, I'm sure that uh, your your passion at least did not uh, did not go uh, to a waste, right? Now, at least it is being used for a greater purpose, more than just tourism, but like you said, also for educational purposes and even to heal uh, certain people. So I, I feel like that that's really something that's really great. Um, so uh, back to you being like a, a self-taught artist, which big Pictural artists have inspired you, or who do you admire as a as a painter or as a person? Um, 
Okay, let me describe uh, my process of uh, getting inspiration for paintings. I normally don't just zoom in on say one artist or even the book, uh, one author. To uh, I um, observe things more widely because I feel like I'm an explorer. So I look at all types of art, all sorts of mediums, and I absorb ideas in, in a broad sense gener generally. But for the case of mural painting, what first inspired me was, I have to admit, uh, you know, the Penang-based artist, Ernest Zakharovic, who painted those murals in Penang and got very famous. That caught my eyes because um, of his success in Penang. Um, that kind of uh, inspired me to do something in Singapore because we, we didn't have that style in Singapore at that time. Uh, when it comes to other painters, uh, for example, my canvas paintings, I admire a lot of uh, the veteran artists like Chua Miati and Ong Kim Singh um, for, again, the old, old nostalgic and realistic type of paintings, which is my genre. We can see that in a lot of your in a lot of your paintings, they do evoke uh, a, a a sense of nostalgia and a sense of heritage, and uh, not just in Singapore. I know that you were also commissioned to to do mural paintings in Hong Kong, in India, and so so in and also in Malaysia. So, what do you think is the magic that lies in your artwork that that makes anyone, um, both tourists and also locals, as we see now, fall in love with them? What do you think is the is the is the magic formula? <laughs> magic formula. There's no magic formula. <laughs> I, did, I didn't think too deeply about the formula. I just did what I like to do. But I suspect, I can only suspect, that what people love most is the content. See, because I'm an untrained artist, self-taught artist, that's a better word, mm. um, I focus more on the content rather than the techniques. Mm. <laughs> um, I think that personal touch and personal storytelling is more like the, you can say, magic or winning formula. I didn't overly focus on the technique because um, I just did it my way. There's no training behind it, no science <laughs> behind it. Uh, I can tell that my technique is not like, you, know, you, you can tell when I look at how a professional artists paint a painting and my brush strokes, yeah, it's not quite up to par. But I think the content that I present to the world, to everybody to see, it's about myself and it's very unique and it's, uh, it's my own imagination my own stories, especially the stories that I uh, embed into each artwork. For example, my Chinatown home, I don't remember, I don't think I've ever seen an artwork that somebody painted on the street about his or her old house. And it's really authentic old house, how it looked like it was exactly what it is. So when I see people walking past, I'm not sure whether people will say, oh, this looks realistic, it's well painted, but many people can associate with the content. That means, oh, this house, these objects, this bed, the posture of the people were exactly what they remember when they were childhood. So Yu Chong, out of all these murals that you have done around Chinatown, which is the one that you would like to take us to? Let's go to my favorite mural, my Chinatown home. All right, let's go. I grew up in Chinatown and I have lived here for 14 years of my life. Chinatown is still my hometown today. In the old days, I would describe Chinatown as messy, rundown, but homely. Today, it has changed. I would describe it as touristy, but still traditional. 
My Chinatown home was inspired by my old home at Sago Lane. I wanted to paint the interior of the house. Great and fond memories. I wanted to showcase how the interior of the house looked like to the world. Many people have seen all these old houses from the streets but never had the chance to see how it actually looked like. So I painted it, not just for myself, but for everyone to have a peek and to understand how we lived. So I mean, so now now we have talked about so many artwork and uh, murals that you have done. Which part of 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 over the last six years did you did you feel like it was the highlight of your career? Highlight of my career, mm. yeah, six years. Wow, time flies. Right, yeah, and we 15, still met. The last yeah. time we met was the three years ago yeah. while you were doing the painting. Yeah. Um. The highlight must be when I call myself an artist, <laughs> because before that, I was I always call myself a accountant, part time artist. Now I can say I am full time artist, more time artist. I'm proud of it. I'm sure it is, and uh, we are going to move on from from your your profession now as a self taught artist into the topic of sustainability, mm-hmm. which is something that uh, we we focus on on this podcast, which is sustainability in travel and tourism. And uh, from the past few episodes, we have learned that sustainability does not only uh work, does not only include uh on the environmental aspects, but also includes the society, the community, and the cultural aspects. Mm-hmm. It's also equally important. With uh, in this whole umbrella of sustainability and you mentioned that uh, heritage is something that uh, is very important to you and that you want to preserve it for the next few generations so uh, I guess it's good to ask you why is it uh, why is heritage uh, a value that uh, that is so important to you okay uh, I heard you use the word preserve I personally cannot preserve heritage Okay, why I, I think um, you know her- heritage is something that is evolving. I don't think you can just preserve. Preserve means you know a snapshot in time, and then you preserve it as is. It's stationary uh, throughout. I w- would say uh, I am interested in promoting. M- heritage whether it's bygone or whatever is left promote it expose it to young generations or even old generations just reminisce uh, draw interest so that more people are interested and then appreciate it and thereby conserve it more so that's what i aim to do rather than preserve it in a standstill mode I guess I understand. Uh, yeah. pre- preserving is it's a much larger scale, but at the same time, like, what? Why is this like whole topic so so important, important to, to you? Me. Yeah. Um, I am naturally interested in um, culture, and and you know, just now I even talk about how I'm an accountant. When I get to see the rest of the world and how people operate, um, uh, I get excited. Um, that's why I like to uh, promote culture because I appreciate it and I enjoy it. So for the case of uh, my own uh, heritage, which is mainly Chinatown where I grew up, I have seen a lot of things that have already disappeared over time or dwindling over time. So what better way than express this on the walls for everyone to see get exposure and then when people appreciate it they will again propagate more of it um you know when more people enjoy it appreciate it they will conserve it just like what i what i say and i think it's for example all this uh, old school things i think when i paint some of these things on the wall i see even like uh, uh, people talk about it people Again, you know, dig their own old photographs and show it on the social media. Uh, even National Heritage Board, they, they, they have the same thing. You know, they, oh, 
we we also collaborated and promote more interest in it and it's good because the younger people who may not have seen it because some of them they may have uh, disappeared or it, they don't know where to find it and now they get to see it Mm, like you were mentioning just now that uh, a lot of the sites that you used to grow up with are no longer around yeah. in Chinatown and obviously that is a uh, that is the result of gentrification that as we all know but um so when we spoke to Ing So in episode 3 he actually had quite a good um quite a good feedback I would say about gentrification because he feels like um it is it is uh, it is a sign of uh, growth and so he he sees it as being positive but obviously how to how to preserve and how to you know um, make th- make make the heritage building still uh, as it is it's it's one of the problems that i guess uh, we can all learn from so from from your perspective um especially uh, you grew up in chinatown and you saw how the whole uh, central business district as we see in singapore right now changed over the last few decades right so um what do you feel about um this modernization and this gentrification that is uh that is happening uh, not just in Singapore but as you see from uh, all around the world gentrification is not a bad word in my opinion it's more of an evolution something that I feel in the modern globalized world uh, something you can't escape but you can manage you can slow down or you can even influence how it can be positive to a gentrified community. So, for example, in Chinatown, um, actually I feel sad that many of my uh, childhood places have been demolished. Right, The main one is my old childhood home. The whole, the whole row of houses have all gone. In fact, the whole of Sago Lane, the whole street, have disappeared from the map. It's sad because I lost the connection with the place whenever I go there. There is no item, people, or even the mood to identify it as the place that I knew. So the connection with people, places, time have been disorientated. And then you question, what's my identity? So I think that's the negative part. That means totally gone. But the good thing is uh, in Chinatown, there are still many old shop houses left. Uh, the shelves, they, they are good reminders and they, give, they still give me, for example, the, the famous cross junction of Smith Street and Trangano Street, uh, which I have fond memories of. It's still there. I can associate with that corner very much. The, the, the buildings there. So it, it helps me to feel I belong to Chinatown. I have a sense of identity to with, with it. That's my roots. Um, and then when, when you, you question about uh, gentrification, uh, I think in Chinatown, the, the bad thing is that the way we have gentrified it is through... No, I, I won't say the way. We, the way we have changed Chinatown uh, was in the 1980s, mid-1980s. Uh, we uprooted everything. All the residents were moved out. All the business owners from the shops were all moved out and rehoused in the Chinatown complex, leaving just the shelves and they had to just renovate the houses. And thereafter, a few years later, we put back new businesses, new shops with uh, little regard for the keeping or even moving back some of these old shops and trades. So that's how we have lost the Chinatown that I knew. Compared to, say, Little India or Geylang or I think Kampong Glam and Chinatown is kind of similar. Um, Or Tiong Bahru, right? That's more organic. So we didn't uproot everything. We let it happen organically or slowly. And that's why in Little India, you still keep a lot of the old traits and residents there. So you believe that... Um, Makes a difference. Put, 
putting like how to um letting letting time uh kind of uh, evolve itself is a better way to manage this kind of development do you yeah. think that's better yes yeah much better but like i said it's inevitable you cannot cling on to the old things so some people say oh you your art preserve this as no 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 it doesn't preserve it also doesn't encourage people to cling on to the old ways of life or old memories per se the idea is like i said to expose to let people reappreciate so that more can be done to conserve whatever is left and why is it important like i said uh, it's a way to connect to our roots otherwise we all lose a sense of identity and get disoriented Mm, uh, I'm sure that uh, what we are speaking now is also probably a relevant uh, issue that is faced by a lot of different places around the world because um, a lot of is is we are not just talking about Singapore here because Singapore is just like one red dot in the whole world, right? We also see the same problems probably in Malacca and Penang, who are quite na- near to us. But I'm sure um, a lot of different places around the world are also facing the same thing. So, um, let, so in terms of preservation of, of culture, I think another preservation that we can safely say is uh, of our environment right with our nature natural environment and i know that you are quite a committed member of the nature society of singapore i was quite uh, i was quite uh, interested to to know um how did it come about and how did you like what what was the what was the opportunity for you to to enter this uh, this society in singapore <laughs> um when i was a youth I have always been exploring Singapore with a topographical map. And so I, I enjoyed hiking. Sometimes. Very organic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I know all the nooks and corners those days before Singapore became what it is today. Um, it went on even during the army. Do you believe it? When I was in the army, I even uh, went to do a hiking in the Himalayas by taking leave. You know, most people will t- take leave, go during army and not enough of uh, <laughs> not enough strenuous hiking. exercise. <laughs> <laughs> so I took leave with another uh, army mate. We, we went hiking or, or trekking in the Himalayas. Uh, yeah, that, that's how extreme I was. And even... During the army, I even uh, chose some of my army mates. Let, let's go Malaysia hiking. <laughs> so you already had this like natural tendency to 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 be in love with yeah, nature, yeah, I love and everything. Mm. I see that continued. Uh, in two thousand and ten or two thousand nine, I believe, uh, when I was taking part in some of the hikes organized by Nature Society, so I, I kind of. Uh, befriended the committee members who discovered that I was an accountant. So they, they needed accountants to help them with the treasury work. So I said, okay, I will volunteer. That's how I joined the, the uh, nature Exco, society. Yes, I see. Yeah, and, and help them uh, improve their accounting systems. Mm. And what were some of the projects that, that you did? Um, maybe, because I know that the society is mainly focused on Singapore and Malaysia. So what were some of the conservation projects, if any, that you have participated in? Okay, honestly, um, aside from those uh, early days where I really joined in the activities, including even kayaking in the mangrove forest, when I became, uh, uh, when I joined the Exco, the security committee, I did that less because I spent all my time really doing all the administration work, you know, helping to improve the compliance, control, and the finance of the the society. So I did less. But because I sat in the committee, I got to learn a lot more in depth of the, the meanings behind it, not just, oh, go hiking, oh, just go kayaking in the mangrove, appreciate nature. Um, I really understood what it takes to conserve. And that's that's why I keep saying, you know, in, in fact, the, the Nature Society mandate is to promote interest and appreciation of nature amongst the citizens, among the residents, so that when they are interested, when they appreciate, they will care to conserve. 
interesting yeah. interesting uh how do you call that uh, natural progression yeah, it's sequence. not it's not throwing you right from the get-go yeah. and say you have to conserve but actually because after you know how to appreciate then you can then back you care to it, conserve right? mm. yeah and then of course the the inside the nature system there are many scientists based science based uh personnel like uh, pro- pro- professors and um, people who really spend many years understanding nature so I took part. I didn't really take part. I was part of the the, the organization, so I, I also get to learn one particular uh, project we call the ESN, the the Citizen Science Project. Every Singaporean is a naturalist. Okay, and what what was that? What was that about? So it's to promote uh, every citizen to be taking part in. Like uh, interest in the the science, it's a citizen science project. So once you know, understand the science of things, then you get to be interested and know how to conserve things. So we also involve uh, like students in like uh, identifying butterflies, what helps butterflies to propagate. You know how it's it's about science, science base. Mm, so using science to uh, also at the same time to pick interest yes. in yeah. people to yeah. to know more about conservation. Yeah, mm, yeah, I see. And uh, talking about the whole nature aspect, I know that uh, a recent project that you were working on is the Bukit Timah uh, forest that you were drawing, and I saw that on your Instagram, and. Uh, I, I guess that is also kind of uh, it, it kind of echoes what we uh, faced here recently with regards to you know clearing more more forests and more greenery for housing development and things like that. But we're not going to go into that. What I was interested in is that uh, you actually used uh, Instagram for as a as a voice to actually uh, speak up about uh, these kind of issues and so. What was your feeling like, um, like behind uh, painting that Bukit Timah uh, forest uh, painting, and uh, what did you want to convey uh, through social media? Oh, okay, that Bukit Timah painting. Um, actually, that painting is part of uh, a fifty meter long painting that I'm aiming to showcase Singapore, Singapore's uh, in the nineteen seventies and eighties, the the diversity of everyday life uh, showcasing its culture and heritage heritage includes the cultural heritage as well as the natural heritage which many people f- tend to forget <laughs> and that's why i have to include Puketema because it's such an important um, biodiverse compact land you know with with uh, the majority of the species based in that small area which is Bukit Timah Hill. Um, it's a story that I wanted to showcase that I, I think people should know that we have this jewel, this gem right in the middle of an island. There's no, no need to like go too far to, to look for a jewel. And because it is so precious, we have to appreciate and we have to conserve whatever is left now. And you can see from the painting, I had a big lobang, a big hole already cut out of Pukatima. That was the Hinde quarry. Yeah, that was a yeah. quarry. Uh, yeah, I, that's a quarry yeah. that I already cut out a big chunk of the hill. And then uh, at the back of the hill, I also drew a uh, the PKE, Pukatima Expressway being built, which to me, um, I, I won't say right or wrong because that was a decision made at that time to cut through the whole forest. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't have that traffic now. And I don't know where it will go underneath or by the sides. A, it's it's a, a delicate balance between economic pursuit and you know, preserving our natural heritage. Um, yeah, it's it's not. A choice actually sometimes if we have to uh, go for livelihood and developing a nation when you are not so affluent and where you're younger compared to now when you're more affluent you got a lot more choices you, know, you you can find alternative ways so when you are uh, less on survival needs you will definitely 
go for uh, options of a higher level, which is keeping heritage. Mm, it's under the, the Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs in a way, <laughs> Maslow, right? Yes, it's like, it's like that, yeah. After we go to the basic, then we move up. But I thought what was interesting was that you decided to use that platform to actually speak up about about um, preservation and conservation. And so, um, and, and you managed to do it in a way that was, I thought it was, um, it was, educational but at the same time not not very like you know hard on and tell tell people that oh you have to do it so like how how do you think we can do better in this respect to actually use a voice to to talk about preservation and conservation because honestly that that i think that's something that we kind of lack uh, in this today's society um first i'm not really an activist in any field i just happen to use what i'm passionate about to apply it into my art um, because my art is something that I feel people look at most. So it's a good way to tell a story. And when you are passionate about that story, just showcase it using my art. Uh, I'm not also very savvy in using social media. So it's just incidental. But I think uh, it's a good place to voice out. Although even though I'm not uh, intentionally using social media to be a voice, uh, it, it, I think it's a good opportunity that I will make use of more in the future. So now that you have taken my mind, I think it's a, it's a good uh, idea to, in the future, make a series of paintings or artworks about uh, nature, conservation per se, and not just part of, like, I described the whole Singapore painting as part of it. Well, yes, I'm I'm happy that uh I managed to uh motivate you to <laughs> to to go on your next uh next collection. I will definitely look out for for that when you do it. Um, I guess in in this part, I guess I think we can summarize a bit. Uh, and maybe that's going to be a challenging question for you. But do you think that artists can also be change leaders? Yes, definitely. Many artists have big change leaders. Uh, for example, Banksy. He, his messages are subtle or loud, whatever you call it, and they kind of sometimes wake people up. For example, climate change or political injustice. Yeah, they, they are really good avenues. But coming back to me, again, I don't try to just you know, bang into the face put a message into my art. My art is simple. It's nice to look at. That's why I don't have controversial figures in my art. I, as people ask me, oh, can you paint uh, Lee Kuan Yew? Said, uh, it's better to just keep it uh, general. general, right? This is not any particular person I'm portraying. It's just general. And um, some people say, oh, your art also promotes racial harmony. I say, yeah, 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 yeah. It also incident because I'm just painting life as it is in Singapore. Not that I intentionally want to promote, you know, bang in the face. Let's be harmonious. It's not like that. It's, I'm just painting everyday life. Every day on the streets, you see Malays, Indians, Chinese, Eurasians, or I mean, about it is what it is. We live harmoniously. Then that's a good point. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you, you pointed out Bang C because yes indeed that he actually really uses his uh, art to to really bring out a message and although maybe um it is not your ultimate uh um goal right you you just want to share your story but at the same time by sharing your story in a way you also you also saw that change has been made yeah. around you yeah I, I try to be more organic in a way and I'm sure that you know ha having good content and uh, like having like this this passion innate in you, I think that's how we can all move ahead. So um, we talked a, a lot about uh, your your involvement in sustainability and also involvement in uh, in 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 your pursuit to becoming an artist. So now I guess uh, this this is the part that I really really am very interested to to ask you more about because I didn't really uh, get much of it uh, through your other interviews and all. It's actually about your very interesting travels around the world. Um, uh, we were we were talking about it earlier. It's not that you haven't been to all the major cities and tourist attractions around the world, but you choose to actually uh, showcase those uh, off the beaten track uh, 
uh, destinations such as uh, Georgia, uh, you went to Nepal, Egypt, Bhutan, Uzbekistan, Mongolia, Guatemala. I mean, I'm, I'm listing all these countries that um, a lot of people would, ne- would not usually go. And I wanted to ask, like, uh, what were some of your most uh, poignant uh, um, travel memories from, from visiting these countries? Okay, maybe first, you're right. I choose to showcase some of these uh, countries more than those mostly visited by many people, cities. Uh, because also because the I also want to showcase the unique cultures. You know, now by now you know I am a person who like to explore, love culture, love to showcase so that more people can appreciate their cultures. And I find these places has very rich history and cultures that not many people are even aware of. But having said that, I also beware that when you say off the beaten track, huh? because nowadays uh, when you step on the off the beaten track, there's a danger to turn this off the beaten track to become a beaten track and spoil it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I know what you mean. It's like, uh, for example, we were talking a bit earlier about Santorini and how it became, uh, when 20 years back, it was really uh, an exclusive destination and now it's become like mass tourism, uh, like infected, right? Mm. When, when I travel, I like to immerse myself into the lives of the communities. So whenever I travel, I try to do a homestay wherever possible. A homestay means getting into someone's home, but with not like a hotel. So you have to bear with the basic needs there. So I did homestays in Guatemala, in Vietnam, Cambodia, Morocco, China, uh, even, even Malaysia. Yeah. Um, one of my more memorable one ah Mongolia let me talk about the Mongolia one because that homestay is a very unique it's, it's actually just the Mongolian tent so my wife and I we, we drove like a, many hours looking for that tent we couldn't find a tent why? because they move about and the driver uh, although with the handphone with the the jail owner the, the house owner we could, they could have located him because they said, oh, it's, it's near, but there's no, because it's just all vast land. So we took another three hours before we could find, almost sunset already. <laughs> we were so lost. It was so funny. So I, we really enjoyed that night there. We actually uh, were advised don't uh, bring things that are useless. So we went earlier to the market to buy just those useful things to give to the, the house owner or, or the tent owner, uh, which is a family of, uh, with, with two uh, daughters. And then there's a boy who is probably a, a cousin or so. Um, when we stayed there, we got to see how they hurt their ships. Because it was April, it was just after the winter, we learned that they have lost many ships during the harsh winter. So they used to have like 600 ships, but they only have half of it, 300. That means almost 300 died during the winter. It was so sad. When we heard that, it was like, oh, wow, it's heartbroken. I mean, the winters there are yeah, very harsh. Very right? harsh. So... Yeah, half the ships died. So we also followed them to like hurt the ships. And it, it was so funny. They, you know, it, that was 2010. Um, the the little boy, not not little, the youth was riding a horse and then trying to hurt the ships back. The mm. sun was setting. Mm. They counted the ships. Some some ships were lost. So he, he panicked. Next, he whipped out his handphone to call his neighbor. <laughs> so after an hour, the neighbors, oh, okay, we spotted it. They were using binoculars and looking for the ships. And then finally, the neighbor helped herit the ships back. And then in the night, we asked the neighbor, please join us. You know, we, we couldn't really talk to them because they, they don't speak English. We don't speak Mongolian. So it's more like a e a a Body language. <laughs> Body language. And in the nighttime, it was so cold, but the, there were only two beds in the tent. They slept on the floor. The whole family slept on the floor and let me and my wife sleep. Wow. Yeah. That's, uh, that's definitely yeah. a very local yeah. experience. Yeah. And then another uh, 
uh, homestay we did in Guatemala. Same, we couldn't speak to the family at all because the man of the family, uh, who was our driver, he, or, or I mean, not the driver, he was a guide and driver. He was the only one who spoke English, but he had to go to work in the day. So we left me and my wife with the the women and the children, and we all eat, eat all. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was funny and then we we noticed some of the questions and when the man came back we asked the man and we had a good laugh when we translated what we were trying to say to each other <laughs> very amusing experience yeah and also at night we heard bombs like a blasting we got scared you know? so they they we, we asked are we safe because you know in guatemala lots of guns and violence they said, no, no worries. This, this were to signal that in that day, there are no murders. It's a celebration uh, shoot. They, they, they probably shoot it in the sky. Yeah. So that's how they, they could tell. Mm. Well, that must be a <laughs> totally 180 degree uh, difference from what we are used to. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> so like, you were mentioning like um, that you prefer to have a homestay method to, to, to immerse yourself in the local culture. Um, and I guess this is, a, this is another, going to be another uh, question for you to think about. But what do you think, um, uh, what, what, what do you think uh, makes a sustainable traveller and how can we become a sustainable traveller? Sustainable traveller. Um, perhaps I would say what is not sustainable. Mm -hmm. I think, like I said, you know, when a track is overly bitten, it becomes not sustainable. First, the track divides. You know, whenever something cuts in the middle, it already divides. Uh, when you are overcrowded or overused. The place is no longer what it used to be. Uh, it lost its uh, originality, its authenticity. That's not sustainable. So you you will have imagined that uh, some of this uh, Instagram posts when they showcase a beautiful place, but of course behind the scene you know that many people are queuing <laughs> to take that same photograph, that same spot. For example, I've seen one in Bali and then I was shocked when somebody actually took the queue for signing up. When in the Instagram post, you only see one person in the beautiful scene, a backdrop. Uh, I don't think that that's the kind of tourism that we should be aiming for. I That's why I try to avoid all this uh, mass tourism. But I'm also wary that wherever I go, I don't want to spoil the place. I'm also wary that when I do homestay, I, I make sure I respect the family, respect their culture and not pollute them. I also, before that, I also try to do my homework. Should I give money? Should I buy useful things like for the Mongolian family? Uh, so as to respect their culture and not make them more greedy in the future when they receive guests. Uh, yeah. O non overly pollution no, don't over overcrowd the place and respect the culture that is my definition of uh, sustainable i see and i i see a lot of uh, common point is empathy right you have you you are thinking that what you can you provide as well mm. and not mm. just what you can take back from mm. from mm. these people mm. and i think that, that that's uh that's also one of the I would say one of the most uh, important values I learned through my travels as well. I mean, all know that travel helps us to open horizons, you know, as, as, as we say, right? So yeah. um, what, what do you think uh, has all these um, varied travel experiences helped you uh, as, uh, as a, in your career as an artist? Um, it helps me to be open-minded and appreciate a diverse range of uh, issues, viewpoints, ways of doing things, and not have a one-sided mindset that this is right, this is wrong. Uh, can I share with you another short story on my trip to Russia? Sure, no uh, problem. I, I did a detour uh, because I did a lot of work in Russia, in Moscow. So I took the opportunity to go to St. Petersburg. You know, we always have this 
stereotype of uh, countries or people. The Russians, they are dangerous, they are rude or what. You know. When I was in Moscow, I whenever I go to all those train station, I, I couldn't speak Russian. So I indeed true. So it kind of a, it reinforced myself. Oh, yeah, why why are this uh, station people you know, over the counters, ticket counters, uh, scolding me? I, I didn't even say anything. They just shoot me away. So it reinforced my stereotype of, oh, they are rude and they are rough. Then something happened. I missed a train. Actually, I went to the wrong station <laughs> to catch a train from St. Petersburg back to Moscow. I went to the wrong station. I almost wanted to board the train, which is also heading for Moscow. But I was shooed off by the, uh, the conductor. I already stepped onto the train. I said, no, 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 look at my ticket. Get out. I was shocked. So I came back down onto the platform. Otherwise, I'd get just pushed out, which is too dangerous. I, I said, wow, again, it's like reinforcement. Then I realized that uh, I went, went around and asked. I even sh tried to show a ticket, uh, but people there couldn't speak English. So I was very, very lost and very kanchong, very, very anxious until uh, I approached, I approached uh, an elderly couple. Surprisingly, they spoke in English. And they looked at my ticket and said, this is not the right station. <laughs> <laughs> then it dawned upon me why I was shoot off the train. So they said, no, you have to go to another station. But then I said, I will have missed the time. They said, don't worry. Let me drive you. Let, let them drive me to the next station. Because I approached them, I felt safe and they are elderly, so I said, okay, I will follow you with a little bit of doubt that you know, they will <laughs> rob me or kidnap me. <laughs> so I followed them anyway. And we went to that station. We missed the train already. So I was almost in, almost going to cry. Desperate. Said, yeah, desperate. Because I need to get back to Moscow. Uh, they said, don't worry. Let's try another station. I didn't know there are so many stations in St. Petersburg. So we went, they drove me to another station. Luckily, a few hours later, there was another train to Moscow. And they even offered to pay my tickets. I said, no, 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 I had money. Um, I really was so thankful to them. Um, yeah, that really changed my mindset about how we uh, have stereotypes and yet you know there are real people on the ground you have thought that the, the conductor just shoot you off the train no you bought the, you <laughs> bought the wrong train oh, because we couldn't speak english and russian we, we had lots of misunderstanding so i know experiences like this through travels really open up my minds and really hold back any judgment of things and when i do my art. I also put a lot of uh, diverse range of issues, for example, nature, not intentionally, you know, but as part of the, the topic, uh, like racial harmony too. And uh, I say, it's just there. There's no uh, intentional, like push, push it into your face type of message, but let people judge, let people decide what this art is all about. Art hope, is an open yeah, form in the first place. it's an open thing. It's for all to interpret. And I just hope that when people see it, they don't jump in to, to make judgment and be open-minded and be receptive. Mm, yeah, so um, I, I really like how, how we are summarizing it so far. So we talked about art, we talked about travel, we talked about conservation and obviously on sustainability, right? Um, I guess this is a... We, we are almost approaching the end of this interview. What are your hopes actually for for the next generation when it comes to like uh th this all these topics, especially you were mentioning you have two kids who are already adults, right? Well, what what do you wish you know for them to 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 appreciate more in terms of uh, all these all these facets that we talked about? I hope the world will be peaceful. Um, based on all this news that I'm 
seeing now, especially during the pandemic, there's lots of conflicts, conflict for resources. So it's not the peaceful world that I wish it can be better. So I wish that in the coming years, as the pandemic uh, dissipates and the world, the earth recovers, we pay more attention to maintaining peace and our environment. Um, environment because I don't want my children and grandchildren to be living in a world that is not hospitable uh, and all the cultures have been lost because we overwhelm each other. So, yeah, I hope we have a sustainable, livable earth. Mm. Very simple, but also not something that we cannot achieve, right? We can definitely do that through our small means. And uh, um, in terms of like you were you were saying how uh, we, we all know how you managed to actually uh, retain your passion and also using that passion to keep, you know, p- pushing yourself forward in terms of your career as an artist. Um, what would be your what would be your advice to to um, to the younger people who wish to also pursue a path like yours? To be an artist, you mean? Yeah. I don't n- know enough to advise, but I can share what I have gone through personally, and I think it worked. Uh, for young people, if you are interested in pursuing art now, I think you should go in uh, and do something that you are passionate about. Because like I said, I, I go in, I try to do something that is uh, I'm passionate about, especially the content. Because uh, especially nowadays, uh, with social media, it's so much easier to publicize your art than you know, a few decades ago. And also, there are also more support and appreciators of art, pat- patrons of art. Uh, um, there are... There, the demand for art now is much more than decades ago. So go for it, but create your own style. Uh, do something you are passionate about uh, that is unique to you. But of course, in the beginning, you may like to imitate other artists or artworks. Uh, but over time, I think you will find your niche and and keep true to yourself really using your own like interpretation right of what you remember as a kid and you put it in your artwork which um, still shows its very raw form and as you mentioned it is not uh, it is not like a refined like it's not technical right it's just your self-expression yeah, I, I believe there's no right or wrong <laughs> about art. <laughs> totally. And so before we end this interview, any sort of like artwork or literature or films that um, that you would like to recommend uh, that really inspired you uh, in over the last few years? There's one particular film that have etched into my mind for years, even, even before I watch it. The show is called Himalaya. It's about the people in the Dopo region in Nepal bringing salt to the city. No, sorry, not salt. Bring wheat to the city and bringing salt back to the village. Yeah. I wouldn't let too much cats out. Um, you should watch this very cinematic film with a very deep meaning on heritage and people relationship and also open-mindedness. Mm. Thank you so much for the recommendation. We will leave it in the in, <laughs> yeah. in the references so everyone could check it out. But in any case... It's a very old film, by the way. I think it was 1990s or something like that. Well, I'm, I'm sure uh, with the technology now, we can definitely rewatch it somehow. But in any case, thank you so much for sharing about how, you know, all these things uh, seemingly, that are seemingly uh, distant from each other are actually very well connected in terms of art, uh, heritage, culture, sustainability and travel. And uh, who better to talk about all this than you? So thank you so much for being on the episode today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.